Now let's get started. I have um, a couple of interesting things uh, to mention that were just going on here. Um, the library is now doing a, um, ha it has a new connection with the Peninsula Pulse. So um, we're gonna be doing a column called things you didn't know about the library. So look for that. And this week, the first one I had to write about ancestry.com and uh, some of the resources we have. Hi, Chris. Um, so look for that in the pulse. This it should be coming out soon. Hi, Chris. Have we have you joined us before, or is this your first time? This is my first time, and I'm in the process of renaming. That is my husband. So I'm going to put my name, so you will understand why I'm here. Okay. I, I am joining you. I'm Michelle Diamond Eliason, and I'm joining you from Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> but you have Door County uh, relatives? Yes, yes. Well, for about three years, um, when we've been visiting, back visiting relatives in Wisconsin, we've been trying to get up to Door County, and I'm bound and determined that it's going to be this fall. Okay. Um, and I thought, oh, I might need to do some genealogical research there and or some ancestral um, site visiting. Mm -hmm. So I revisited uh, my diamond ancestors from Door County, um, I've been, let's see, working on it for oh many, many years, but revisit about every 10 years, five years. And of course, during COVID, uh, took it up again. But anyway, um, my great, great grandfather, Thomas Peter Diamond, helped develop uh, Door County in the 1870s by building a sawmill and a commercial mm -hmm. pier. So I was really pleased to find not only this group, but also uh, the newspaper archives, which had a lot of articles about him and the pictures, which were really helpful that I've already shared with some of my relatives. Uh, so I was thrilled to get that insight and also to thank, I don't know who it would be, someone put on ancestry.com, the Door County trees. So par parts of that were also on there. So I don't know if that's also this group or somebody else. It was called North, Northern Door County. Um, let me check what it was called. Uh, oh, I don't have that, sorry. It was um, family trees? Yes, it was a public oh. family tree, but it looked like it was made by, I'm trying to find it quickly. Um, that's not it either. It said something like Northern Door County families. Sorry, I think when I joined the Zoom, I clicked off the other, I had it up. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so yeah, I'd be interested in any other insights. I don't, I couldn't find your agenda for today. So I don't know if that's at all on your agenda or you have general things you're talking about. Yeah, we're freewheeling here. <laughs> <laughs> um, we sort of sometimes plan things. Um, but well, I'm glad you joined us. If you have a look at doorcountylibrary.org, we have a page. I make up a genealogy local history page and I pack things in there. Yes, so you find you. lots of resources. Plat maps, if you want to look up. Do you know where you had that pier? Um, well, it was Liberty Grove, but they just say that the newspaper arts articles just say something like he was allowed to, let me get this straight. It just says something like build it into Green Bay. You know, it wasn't something very specific, but at the pictures I can tell, more. and it looks like it's um, Roser, R-O-E-S-E-R, -E -E that family that took it over, if that <laughs> rings a bell with anybody. Um, yeah, I think of that as a Southern Door name, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't recognize it, and I lived up in that area for 25 years, so. Okay, well, that's helpful. Thank you. I don't, I yeah, don't recognize the name, and we rec there, we always say there's only four families in Door County, and that's right. not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he moved, it looks like he was there for a while, and then moved to Green Bay, and then some other places, you know how that goes, so it wasn't um established for generations or something although he did bring his father so i mean there were multi-generational families there but it mm -hmm. looked like um in terms of business but my favorite quote was from um let's see the weekly expositor independent in 1883 and it says thomas diamond of sister bay passed through town wednesday on a business trip to milwaukee as usual he was full of fun and wealth so I, I thought that was a great quote. <laughs> That's a good um, line, yeah. Yeah, really enjoyed that. And that was next to the article about a man who froze 
uh, leaving Sister Bay to visit his brother in Menominee. So not a happy article, but it was a very interesting article as well. But yeah, this is the J.P. Roser, R-O-E-S-E-R -E -E of Sister Bay. Um, yeah. Um, if you look on our library website, um, that page I mentioned, the Peninsula Genealogical Society has a website that they've disbanded, but the website is useful. You can put in a term and um, it pulls up different indexes that they've done over the years. So I'd recommend looking there, among others. Great. That's very helpful. Pen Peninsula Genealogical Society. So yeah, but look through the library website. It's hard to find their website. Okay. Um, so yeah, well, welcome. Thank and you. a lot of us are a lot of the people here don't actually have Door County um, relatives. They're researching all over the place. But I, I just found a couple of things doing a quick look here. Uh, they just kind of disappeared from the phone book. This thing says, although the Champos uh, family is still around and had some some relationship uh, with Wrestler and on Andre Wrestler. Hmm. Yep, that could be wrestler. On the 1899 that was an 18, flat that was an map. Uh, that was in 1877. And then uh, 1870. On the 1899 flat map, uh, A. Roser has some land right around Sister Bay. Okay. Oh, quite a bit of land. Those plat yeah. maps are all on the library website, genealogy history page. Um, 1899 is the first one. There are a couple others, and the latest is 1937 that's online. Okay, oh, this one says in 1878, Roser purchased the lumber mill, a flour mill, and a <clears throat> mile and a half of shoreline wow. uh, at the head of Sister Bay. So it had been up on the northern end of the, of the bay. That there. sounds like wealth to me. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he was one of 16, Andre was. so. Well, that definitely is it because in one of my sources said um, that- He was an enormous man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that Thomas Diamond, you know, got the commission for the pier in these newspaper right. articles. And then I had previously referenced flour mills. Well, then in the other archives that from the library websites, it said a steam powered sawmill. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe that was wrong. So that's referencing the flour mill again. And then something about owning properties and when the hotel sprung up and things. Um, yeah, that, that definitely sounds like it because- uh, then uh, Adolf retired in 41, 1941, Andre died in 1915, and they, I think they sh shuttered the business after 51 years, so. Wow, okay. Yeah, because they even have some of those newspaper articles talk about sending shingles um, from that pier to yeah, Tom. Do a Google on the Sister Bay Historical Society. They have a lot of stuff on it. That's a, that's a great idea, Sister Bay Historical Society. Yeah, I was thrilled to find those pictures because years ago, of course, when we didn't have access to the internet and all these other things, I remember my grandma and I, I think we had rented a cottage up north or something. And so my dad had driven us to look at the records physically. And then of course, now it's a totally different ball game. <laughs> I, I yeah. can't think of the name of the people in, in Fish Creek uh, they own the sporting goods store there in Fish Creek. Maybe you remember the name, one of you do. But uh, Jerry, uh, I can't think of his last name. My wife knew his wife fairly well. Uh, his family and somebody in his family showed me a bunch of pictures from the Fish Creek sawmill. Mm. And that was back in the 1800s to the early 1900s. So that might be a source for you to find. They probably all work together, so. Right, right. No, that's a great idea. Thank you. So you can check that in Fish Creek. <clears throat> was that, uh, Steve, was that Jerry Zog? Oh, no, no. he was Sister Bay. Yes. Uh, it'll, it'll come to me probably about midnight tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, write it down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they had a sawmill. It was, it was, I think the Sawyer family had that sawmill, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, that was part of it. And uh, But like I said, they all, there weren't that many people up here, so. Well, and it, it's interesting you say that because I'm trying to find, I also found that book about, um, let me give you the title. Some of you may be familiar with it, but if you don't have relatives in Door County necessarily, maybe not. History of Door County, Wisconsin, the County Beautiful. Yeah. And it talks about yeah. Liberty, Liberty Grove and then Sister Bay. And um, it was just saying in 1870, Sister Bay was opened up as a shipping point, a firm, 
new, known as Henderson, Coon, and Diamond built to hear, appear at the head of Sister Bay. Thomas Diamond was the leading man in this business. I don't know where that would have been because the Anderson dock is still there and that was kind of the main dock where all the boats came in. We used to have oh. a place in we used to have a place in Ephraim and then we built up in Liberty Grove. Hi Steve. Uh, so that's another place to check and see if there was something connected there. But so I don't that, recall any. Okay, so the, pic, the dock I'm seeing in the picture. Okay, because it has a lot of pictures of the mill and the dock, but it doesn't identify what the dock is called now. Um, but yeah, it's a grist mill and was built two or three stores and a hotel. Um, yep. And then it talks about, yeah, that Roser and then um, still in possession something. And then there's a Patrick Diamond. But yeah, I'm looking at the pictures and it just says Everett B. Clark Company, Sister Bay, Wisconsin, number four. And then there's a really older one showing the, um, the ships. And then, yeah, some like located Northwest along Clark Street, now Mabel with mill in the background. So I have some locational, so the plat, the plat maps will be helpful too. Yep. Um, but those are 1910 and then just has different views of it, bird's eye view, view in the back and some other things. So that's really helpful information. Thank you. Well, welcome Steve. We already uh, mentioned your new granddaughter How's she doing? <laughs> oh, nice. She's here. Uh, just, just held her today, and Grandma did. Ah. Uh, wow. It's a new branch on the family tree, right? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Nice. Congratulations. Everything's fine. Good. What number is that, Steve? Number two grandchild. Ah. I got a picture of her nine-year-old brother holding her. He's bigger, he's taller than my wife. Oh, man. <laughs> Steve, is Christina your daughter? Yes. She's a doll. She's the best. I, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, well, you know her too, right? Everybody up here that deals with the library knows it. Yeah, most of these people are from the Northern Door Genealogical Society, right? A lot uh, of them are. So I'll tell you a secret. She's not Swedish. <laughs> get fluently, but she's Norwegian. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> that was still Norwegian. Speaking of Norway, did anyone watch that uh, Atlantic Crossing on PBS? Yeah. Yeah. That's the theater. That's good. Yeah, about uh, Sweden during, or Norway during yeah. World War II and the Crown Princess coming to the United States. Well, did you see Facebook? What I found here, I brought it up to show you. This is in the Lori History Room. And that's her signature, the Crown Princess signature and the Crown Prince signature at the top, along with um, Frank Grass Ross from that's her county. Judge Grass, right? Yes. Uh, no, that's Henry Grass. Was it, was it oh, Henry name? Grass, yeah. But this, was this booklet came was before the war. The TV shows, whoops is mainly the war, but this is when they toured the United States in 1939. So someone went to a, a program in Madison, got their signatures and brought this here and it's in the Lori History Room. So I think wow. that's pretty neat. <laughs> Especially if you watch that program, you really understand. I had a vague memory of seeing something like that in the glass case and sure enough, there it was. So I'd recommend watching that program. I've ordered the DVD for the library if you can't watch it online or on TV. What's it's, the name again, Laura? Title of the program, it's Masterpiece Theater. Uh -huh. I don't, they still have a few more to go, but it's Sunday night. Um, it's called Atlantic Crossing. Okay. And it's about when the, uh, the Germans invaded um, Norway during World War II and the crown princess tried to leave to Sweden and then she went from Sweden she had to leave and um, came to the United States and got to be really friends with Roosevelt. So it's a it's a really engaging drama. <laughs> the Scandinavian countries, Scandinavian countries was was a little bit odd because of the Danes and Finland. Sweden was neutral with a puppet government, and Norway was, of course, you know, on the Allied side, and Norway suffered greatly over that. Yeah, well, in the program, they show that they tried to be neutral, but then the Germans invaded them and they had no choice at that point. 
um, and then Sweden remained um, neutral, but apparently they had some friendship with some of the Germans. So um, I a lot of history that I wasn't really aware of. What, what, what I was told when I went there and I got some little handmade doll horses that were folk art made by Norwegian prisoners of war when they were imprisoned in Norway was what I was told by the little shop owner was the difference between um, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway during the war was um, the Swedes were free to run around, do whatever they want. The Norwegian men were put in prison and the Danes, they didn't care, they just killed them. <laughs> Steve, where did, your, where did your Norwegian side settle here in the US? Well, they, they came to Mad, they came Mandrock, I believe. They sit, sat in Mandrock for a little while and then they, they came out here at what they call Shiloh, which is um, Thomas Sturgeon Bay Clay Banks. Oh, well, my Norwegian background. 1870, excuse me? My family, my Norwegian side of the family settled in Madison probably in the 1850s. It was about 1870. Okay. Yeah, I know Wisconsin had a gigantic uh, Norwegian settlement oh, here. Huge. One, yeah. based in the country, right? At one point. Huge, oh. yeah. Yeah. Steve, you mentioned um, you were shopping and got the little Norwegian horses. I thought, you know, the typical you see is what they call a Swedish horse. Dahl horse, D-A-H-L, I think. Oh, okay. Dahl horse. <clears throat> kind of like that, but this was a hand carved very rough with uh, a tail made out of twine. I mean, they had to make this in prison with what they had. Yeah, huh. Because the ones I've seen have just been called Swedish horses and they're all uh, solid wood. No. Um, right. And they're, they're, they're painted colorful. Painted. Right. Okay, right. the Johnson's in yeah. Yeah. up north. The, now, those are the real nice looking sweet horses. I'm talking about the Norwegian horses, which were a lot rougher. Yeah. Now I'll know what I'm looking for when I'm looking at, for stuff for you, Steve, at the yard sales. <laughs> well, where, where, where is it on the old omnibus hill? Little Sweden. I, they probably have them at the gift shop there, too. Ah. Uh, hmm. Well, speaking of photographs, someone was mentioning photographs earlier, um, Michelle was. Um, I had a question from the Maritime Museum, if anyone has a clue, um, Reese over there is looking for a picture of Walter S. Peterson, an artist. Has, does anyone know anything about him? Yeah, I know he's, he's an artist. His, um, murals in the Maritime Museum and, and Reese is trying to find a photograph of him. And I looked on Ancestry He's in a lot of trees, but no photographs at all. Um, what I is it, Laura? Walter, what's the middle initial? His name's Walter S. Peterson. S, okay. He okay. lived from uh, 1912 to 2009, and he um, lived in Sturgeon Bay most of the time. Um, he went into painting later in life, and he, as I say, he got things around the peninsula, but plus these murals in um, the Maritime Museum. And so um, it, on Ancestry, of course, they blocked the kids' names, but the obituary mentions them. So I sent the obituary that I found on Ancestry to yes. read, and he may reach out to the kids. What, what, what was one mention, was one name Tom? Thomas. Tom. Um, there's a Charlene Slavic and Tom, but not Peterson. No, there's a Tom? A Tom Slavic. Okay. He's married to um, one of the girls. Yeah, so. But what did he do during life? Did, did he paint signs? Is that the Wallace signs? I don't think that was his main um, occupation. It doesn't say here. He lived to be 96 years old. Um, a, in the newspapers in 1961, it said he's an amateur painter. Um, he had been painting for six years. So, um, what, what but apparently he, he was very active in the area in um, art groups. What did he do for a living, you know? I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. It doesn't say in this um, obituary. Okay. But if anyone comes across a picture of him, <laughs> let me know because we haven't found one yet. <laughs> I couldn't I'll find one for him. I'll ask my friend Tom who lived on 8th Avenue. Okay. 
and it could be a, a uncle of his. Yeah. Well, S -O -N. Peterson, of course, is a pretty common name around here. Is it S O N? Yes. Okay, uh -huh. but that'd be about the right time frame. So. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I want to just put out, point out one other thing. Look at this, um, Tom. I bought this book because you were were explaining to us how you use OneNote to organize all your genealogy research. Okay, right. <laughs> so you're welcome to come and check this out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Brand new. <laughs> I hate to tell you that I switched back to Evernote. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> why why did that. you make that choice? Okay, well, remember I, I was doing using Edward. I had been using Evernote for, I don't know, three or four years. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, not, you know, I used it for collecting stuff off the internet, you know, and, and storing it and tagging it. Well, then they did an upgrade and the upgrade was horrendous. Okay. And I couldn't use it. And so, um, and I wasn't the only one because on the Facebook page for Evernote, they said the same thing that, you know, it was terrible. And then, so I started switching over to OneNote and I was, moving stuff over to OneNote. And uh, uh, and then I just in the, well, in the process of moving stuff off Evernote, they did another upgrade <laughs> and they corrected all the problems. <laughs> so instead of moving, instead of moving all the notes from Evernote, I just, to OneNote, I just left them on Evernote. And um, um, so <laughs> I've gone back and forth. I've wasted a lot of time is what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is unfortunate, but um, Evernote is is uh, is better. I mean, in the sense that um, uh, the tagging and the searching is a little bit better. But OneNote, OneNote is very good. Okay, as far as if you're just one individual um, and you don't have to worry about any saving to anybody else. Um, uh, OneNote is fine. If I was starting out, okay, I would probably use OneNote because it's free, okay. Whereas Evernote, there's there's a free version, but you want to go up to the next level uh, for some of the goodies, you know. And uh, so, ra you know, so ra and you can't just take everything in OneNote and down or I'm sorry, Evernote and download it into OneNote, okay. It don't work that way because Evernote's got their own file thing, you know, and so um, that's a problem. So, but if I were starting out, I would go with OneNote because I'm I'm just by myself, but you know, I'm just doing it for me. They still have the same uh, web cl uh, clipper, so you can get stuff off the internet and save it to a specific folder or, excuse me, notebook. Uh, OneNote or Evernote has multiple capacity to do multiple notebooks, so you can stack them if you wish. Whereas uh, OneNote, you can only uh, have one main. No, excuse me. You can have a main notebook, and then uh, which you don't attach anything but other notebooks to. Okay, and then you put the notes in them. Whereas with Evernote, you can do a main notebook, one or two levels of other notebooks, and then one or two levels of sections. So there's a, you know, for us who is used to a file cabinet full of stuff, it's, you know, it's easier to use or conceptually easier to use. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Well, yeah. So I, I, for that update. if I was starting out and didn't have to have all these notes that I have, I would probably go with one note. Because it's free. There's no reason, you know, unless you're going to, you know, like I say, unless you're going to do it for a business or something and you want all that capacity, capability, I wouldn't. Do it at all. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, are, is everyone still sticking with Family Tree Maker? Was that the software you decided to use? Yeah, I, I, I switched. <laughs> I use it. Yeah, I switched back. I switched to, I switched to, uh, to uh, Family Tree Maker, and I like it. it it's really nice. And great. The biggest thing that I find with it is that, uh, as compared to um, uh, ever, not what's the other one? Um, I can't remember. Oh, Roots Magic is that 
when you when you you do a source on ancestry, that source is all is the proper way of doing it. Okay, and it automatically transfers over to Family Tree Maker. Okay, mm -hmm. you don't have to set up a source in right. you know, like you do in in Roots Magic. Okay, you got to set up a source, and so you know you got to use the Elizabeth Mills or whatever that big thick book. You know, this one here, Evidence Explained, this big old book. You know, and and look it up. You know, oh, I'm kind of backwards, but okay, but you know what I mean. And uh, try to find the right, you know, the right so, uh, way of doing the source. So, but to me, that's the biggest thing about um, about um, Family Tree Maker. Um, and the fact Tom, that it, yeah. can you explain that a little bit more? Do, do when you do you have a tree on Ancestry <coughs> and on Family Tree Maker? Uh, yes. All right. So whenever you add something to your family tree on ancestry yes. that includes a citation, yes. when you sync it to family tree maker, that citation will move over. Yes, it will. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes, it will. And, yeah, and vice versa. Okay. Because I'm still, um, I don't have a software program yet. Um, and I'm still vacillating in trying to decide what, you know, which one program I want to go to. So that's why I asked the question. I think along Tom's comments, if I'm correct, Tom, maybe I, mis maybe I misread it, but uh, if you download an item, let's say you downloaded a census report or something from Ancestry, if you already have that year's census as a source, it will take it as a citation to that source so you don't end up with a whole litany of uh, sources, which yes. I think a lot of other programs tend to do. Yes. And so you get, yes. when I looked at my sources, they were yes. fractional what they were in the uh, yep. Roots Magic program. Of course, yeah. my citations were pages, but that's okay. That's what yeah. you're looking oh, at. Yeah, so. yeah that's, that's, that's normal. <laughs> yeah. You know. I, uh, yeah. I spent about two hours today trying to figure out how to I was putting a, some photo media into the uh, media section and it kept wanting to revert back to an old folder that I had some other photos in because they don't keep the photos in the program itself. They refer to the photos on your computer mm -hmm. in a separate file. So now I've got two or three <clears throat> folders or what you want to call them that on my uh, Mac that... Uh, has all the photos in it. So you look on the media and some of them go to this folder and some go to that. But when I went and looked at the backup, they were all in one place. So mm -hmm. they kind of have pointers all over the place. And uh, even when I trashed one of them just to say, okay, I want to get rid of this thing. I sent it to trash. It pulled it back. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up. Uh, get one. <laughs> and, and one of the objections I had with initially with Family Tree Maker was the privacy of if there was something I didn't, you know, if I felt there was some family item that I, that I had that I didn't want to share with the world for some reason, I, nothing comes to mind right now, but I could do that by having two separate, you know, a separate Roots Magic and a separate Ancestry web um tree okay well with family tree maker you can in essence hide or mark private right. anything on family tree maker and it won't go into ancestry and I, okay. you can print a list of it all off so you know what you have private also yeah yeah and so which to me answers that one question that i had um mm. so which I guess when I was starting, that's how what I thought I had a lot of, but it really isn't true. With with the way things are going nowadays, everything seems to be on the internet, so mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really matter, <laughs> you know. Is so. that Family Tree Maker nineteen two thousand nineteen? That's two thousand nineteen, yeah. And yeah. that costs what about hundred bucks? Uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, 
they were having a special at for family at the uh, Roots Roots Tech Conference back in February for 40, 40, 40 bucks, I think. 40 bucks, I think it was. Yeah, yeah it was four, I paid 40. So yeah, so I jumped all over that. Steve, you had mentioned that. And so I jumped all over that. Yeah. And I said, well, for 40 bucks, I'll try it and see if I, I think it's it. regularly 80. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 79. Which is very <laughs> comparable with legacy. And you can also, by the way, with Family Tree Maker, you can also connect it so you get hints from Family Search. And I guess you could do it from, uh, well, you can do it from any database, actually. You can do it from Google. You can do it from, which I've not tried. You can also do it from uh, Find My Hair or My. My heritage. I don't know about find my past. I don't know. About find my that. heritage. I think. I think uh, family search. It'll also bring it back into your uh, yeah family search program. Not all of them. I think. I think a couple of them don't allow you to bring it directly into your software. Yeah. 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 But they'll so search there for it. There is a connection with family search too, and and I, well, so, yeah. Mm. So I mean. I would look real hard at Family Tree Maker, you know, if, if the $80 isn't a problem, you know, and um, Legacy is another one that, you know. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, Legacy is the one I'm leaning to, yeah. but I'm probably, you know, the only one here. I would like an offline Family Tree uh, at this juncture. And um, so I've kind of, you know, narrowed it down to that one. Uh, I use I Family Tree Maker. Just I don't have a tree on Ancestry, so I'm using it as the database to keep all my okay, information. So you, I'm not hooked up to the. Okay, I don't so transfer then, anything back and forth. All right, then you're like I could, because it well at this stage anyway. I'm, I'd rather be offline. Don't want to sync or whatever with anything. Yeah. Else. So you could use Family Tree Maker, but not do anything with it for sure. online purposes or syncing sure. or whatever. Sure. You just don't yep. sync it. The sync is not it. automatic. And you it would to... remain on your and it remains on your computer. Yes. Once yep. you purchase it. And you can still do if you have a subscription, you can still do your searching on Ancestry and pull the information in, but it doesn't have to go on a sync. No. Oh, okay. All Same right. With yeah, the best search. of both worlds. Yeah. You can, you can keep, you know, you don't have to connect the family search with Find My Tree. Or, uh, yeah. You don't have to connect to, no. you can still look at, you know, search through family search and then find something and, you know, connect it or take the information. And I can send so, it over, but still, it wouldn't be out there. I'm just not ready for the online syncing and, Whatever, it Mary is. Ellen, you can you you can also go in and uh, let's say you put it out on Ancestry because you want it there, mm -hmm. so your relatives can see it. Yep. You can send them invitations so they have access. They can't do anything to your tree, but they can have access to it, and to only it. those people have access. Uh -huh. So uh, it gives you an ability to share the information without having to be. Yeah, you public. can make it. You can make it private. You can make it totally private so nobody even sees it. Right. And you can make it private to where specific people see it, and and I think and then or make it public. I guess there's just three, isn't there? What an I think ancestry or family no, tree maker? No ancestry. Ancestry and, and family. If I do, maker. yeah, I okay. think there's just three. Family okay. search. I don't think lets you do that. No, yeah, well, that's a world. They got the big yeah. apple in the sky. Yeah. I think. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> that, that would be totally against their purposes. <clears throat> it yeah, certainly they they would. Want, you know, they want one universal tree. <laughs> well, I gotta, I gotta say, I, 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 I do look at family trees wherever they are, ancestry, family search, and so on, just for that elusive little hint that might, you know, jiggle the brain. But that's about it because most of them are, are just horribly wrong you gotta be you gotta be very careful but the thing i have found that's been most interesting is i've been able to pick up pictures and documents once in a while yeah i've had access to yeah well that's but, it once in a while i can glean a little that's worth it right there sometimes you know yeah you're right you're right i don't go by their data all the time but when you get the right pictures that's kind of cool yeah it is yeah 
<laughs> oh, well. So, yeah, Laura, thanks for that book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have another book. You ready no, for it? <laughs> this oh, one. There. Okay. This is a new book in the library, and it's really fun. Since we were okay. all talking about Dirty Helen the other Oh, sure. <laughs> you remember her? Um, by the way, I ordered the, there's a book that came out about Dirty Helen in uh, 2019, and I ordered that. So look forward to that one coming in. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. This Who one is Dirty Helen. Who is this Dirty Were Helen? you here when we talked about her? Well, I heard, yeah, you were talking yeah. about her. She was married. She, um, was. she was a character out of Milwaukee who married um, someone who was eight years younger, who was, um, it, the name is Cromwell without a W. Sounds like Cromwell, but it's Cromwell. Okay. And um, she was married to a Cromwell from Door County, who later became part owner of the CNC Club. Oh, and um, cool. she was famous for running a brothel and tavern in Milwaukee, and a bunch of people here seem to know who she was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, well, what period of time was this? this in, oh, the stories abound with her. Like 20s or 30s? Was it? Oh, okay. Well, yeah. That was, that was a place downtown. What was the name? Yeah, of it was right on um, the oh, river. The Wells in the river. Um, there's Water a little street. street. I think How it was you know? Front yeah, Street. Yeah, Where Front you know Water Water street is, uh, Everybody uh, seems to know her. Well, it became a tavern by the time oh, I was a oh, oh, okay. <laughs> she's, she's very famous. There's lots online about her. Oh and, yeah. Um, I just she was a Milwaukee institution. Yeah, I stumbled into it by looking up the family of the husband, the first husband. I think she was married multiple times. And I found her on the Wisconsin State Historical Society website. Yeah. And then, um, you know, you get down these dark holes once you start looking things up. So this book, this new one, which is Stories of Scandalous Wisconsin, has two entries in here on Door County. <laughs> so one oh, good. is... Um, Washington Island and the story about how they um, managed to keep producing alcohol through the prohibition, you know, with the bitters. Does everyone know about that place? Yep. Yeah. So that's one of them. But the one that intrigued me even more is this chapter, and everyone can check this out on um, honeymoon in heavy weather. You have another, uh, this one is about. A, um, per, a guy named John A. Jones from Chicago, the head of the Dill Pickle Club, married an artist named um, Anna Mitchell, and they were honeymooning up in Door County in Ephraim, and he apparently um, had a boat, and there's a whole long scandalous story about how she drowned, I think, on the boat when they were <laughs> going back towards Chicago. Here's her picture. But what's interesting about it is they knew, do you, does anyone know Sher, Sher, uh, Sherwood Anderson, the writer? Yes. Very, very famous writer. I had to read, I had to read some of his stuff in high school. Yeah, and so apparently he was up here also with the, these two. And um, so uh, he's extremely famous uh, classic American writer. So I started looking on the newspapers and sure enough, here's all sorts of stories about how he made visits to Door County and there were uh, some stories where Sherwood Anderson, his yeah, his wife Sherwood Anderson's wife was named Mitchell also, and so I'm starting to wonder if they were related, but they were friends with this um, this Mitchell who drowned here, and her husband from that pickle club in Chicago <laughs> in this book. So I always get these books, and then you start going down these dark, you know holes of researching things so there's a lot here about Sherwood Anderson in Door County. Be careful our friend from North Carolina may not want to visit. <laughs> <laughs> I know and apparently I know how that goes all my family's still in Wisconsin just <laughs> my husband is also from Wisconsin we're just down here. <laughs> so when Sherwood Anderson was here apparently his wife they were um, for their era and this would be the early part of the century um, they were very um, old, liberal, and so they didn't go by their marriage. The wife didn't go by her married name. She insisted on keeping her maiden name. And so they were kicked out of um, the um, resorts here. <laughs> they is, that, is that where Sherwood Point got its name, Laura? No, no, I don't know. I don't know where that, I don't know where that one came from. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. But um, anyway, this is, these are colorful stories. 
if you're interested. And then one more, I'll just very loosely, um, someone, um, this is, there's another book here that just came in <laughs> on ancestry and how the subtitle is how stories from the past can heal the future. And so it has very sentimental stories of good and bad on doing research on your family history. We all know um, in some cases you find out you Mine have relatives really or didn't have know. relatives. Yeah. Um, yeah. One person came in, one person I was helping was trying to find property on a flat map and we couldn't find the property. Um, and it turns out once I um, found out the name, I started looking online and I came across all this stuff about a murder, a terrible murder here. And so I'm, in a sense, I'm glad I didn't mention that um, that person should look up the name in the newspapers, but, you know, because it's pretty wow. disturbing. <laughs> we all have them. So there's another scandal in Door County. And, you know, we're all, we're all pretty aware of some of the famous murders here. It is kind of disturbing to me that they do tours of these or have done tours of these places in Door County that were pretty horrible murders and things like that. Um, the trolley tours. Yeah, they did. There's an article from 2019 about murder and mayhem was the tour. Yeah. And um, these peop people have relatives here. You know, so it's a kind of hurtful thing in many ways, I would think. I know one of the drivers of that, and I was driving out towards where the crass incident was, because I was driving out that way, and the, the, the trolley was there, and I said hi to the guy, because I knew him really well, the driver, and my dad handled the case, and so I almost it's, had an instant retelling of what happened there. Yeah. Well, some of those relatives are still still with us. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's all I have to say. That was something that kind of threw me off this week, running into all of that. <laughs> that's what happens. I really have good intentions. I'm really going to research this one person. Yeah. <laughs> and see what I can find. And I find something, and then I'm down another path. And another bath, and pretty soon it's five hours later. And geez, I had a lot of interesting stuff that doesn't really fit necessarily. But <laughs> and I think Michelle was mentioning some of that with the newspapers and your relatives. Yeah. Earlier, right? You've been finding stories about them. Yes. And I'm curious how many of the members uh, have written narratives? Anybody? Hmm. Okay. Because that's yeah. what I decided. I made my executive decision that I was going to put all I had so many different sources and additional notes and I was confused and I thought well if I'm confused everybody else is going to be confused so I decided on the narrative because um, a different family tree member had written a narrative that I thought that was the most entertaining and um, way to make some connections for readers in the family that if they weren't going to look up these sources or you know things they might miss but that gets exponentially confusing as you go back and get each different line. So I was wondering if anybody had had any success with that. Um, it's not really that much different from whatever software you're using or a filing cabinet because you always run into the same problem of, okay, now I've got 52 files. How, how am I dividing these? How am I organizing these? Um, anyway, but I just I just was curious well, about that. But it are, you doing it, it, now, yeah. are you doing it like uh, chapters like on one person? Uh, well, I start with a family name and then where when they marry, when they marry, then I kind of do right now just a different chapter and then kind of go back and trace the lineage of the person they're marrying. Um, it's still a little confusing, but for the early generation, since there isn't that much information anyway, it works okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a, uh, it's a strictly a family history you're talking about. Yeah, um, doing when you do, yeah. yeah, go on, Steve. Yeah, what that, that's exactly, you know, you, there's a lot of the software can help you do that. But what I kind of decided to do uh, a couple of years ago is write several page summaries of my memories, like a father, because, you know, he's been dead quite a number of years mm -hmm. now. But so I wrote this elaborate thing out about my memories of my dad from, from as early as I can remember up until he passed away. So I gave it to my brothers who are six, seven, eight years younger than I am. And I said, see what you think. 
and they sat there and they read it. They didn't say a word. <laughs> we read it, didn't say a word. And they said, did we have the same father? <laughs> so the that. caution is everybody has yeah. a different set of primrose glasses that they look at different <laughs> aspects of their, their yeah. tree. And uh, that was something I learned from that little episode was I thought I had this thing really nailed with all the data and everything. Totally different pages. <laughs> yeah, and I hear that happens. And, and I, that's partially why, because my grandma wrote some narrative, you know, this person wrote some narrative. I interviewed my great aunt again two weeks ago. And I thought, okay, whatever memories they have of, you know, this particular person, I want it all in one place. My aunt was busy scanning the pictures. So then we had the debate about do we put the pictures in? Where do we put the pictures? What do we do with the pictures? Do we put them on Facebook and have people comment? Do we put them on a thumb drive? I mean, so it's kind of this, you know, the positive and negative part of technology of now you have all these options and what really going forward is going to withstand time and how do you get, reach the most number of, you know, people in your family according to their technology. So yeah, no, I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll throw one thing out there. Um, if it's nonfiction and it, it speaks to Wisconsin history, there's a site called Recollection Wisconsin. I've mentioned this before to the others. And um, by and large, the main Recollection Wisconsin site is institutions um, and history of Wisconsin. But there is a, a branch off of that where you can individuals can post history about um, Wisconsin and like the different historical societies, small groups have posted things. I help people writing in memoirs with um, a writing group up here, right on Door County. And one lady um, wrote her mem memories of Martin Park. And I sent that to that um, offshoot of Recollection, Wisconsin. So her story, her memories of Martin Park are there. So if you have, um, you know, there are memories of people, if it's, um, you can look at the site and see what's there. But as far as reaching, people around the world, it actually filters into the Digital Public Library of America. So it's, um, you know, pretty much um, reaching everyone you want to reach all over the world. So um, that's one really good site to use. It's free to send something in if it fits their um, purpose, their mission. Great. Thank you. But the main site is recollectionwisconsin.org, I think, but the small site is recollectionwi.org but it's all hooked in together. And as I say, free for any individual to send something if it fits, fits what they're posting. So Early on, I, I started um, with the idea that I would write up a, a book basically like this for each family and each family was the grandfathers. I took started my grandfathers, that's where I started at, my grandparents rather. And uh, I started with the one that I knew the least. That's where my research had started. And the idea was, is I was going to go back as far as I could go. Okay. Little did I know <laughs> what I was putting myself into. And, and you know, write up a family based on my research, uh, write up a history at each generation. Okay. And talk about... Um, well, you know, include pedigree charts, uh, uh, I don't know, descendant listings of everybody, and so on and so on, and a narrative based upon my research of, of uh, you know, everybody. And, it, you know, it worked out okay, except that obviously when I got four or five generations down the road, I didn't have much information, okay? So it was pretty blank, okay? But I included pictures and all that, and I included maps. And like, here's a whole set of pictures of, of the family that I had acquired through research. Um, most of them tended to be, of course, pictures around here, around Wisconsin, because that's where they were. Uh, there were some I could get off the internet. Like I got a picture of their church over in Pomerania or, or Poland now, uh, which was off the internet. And uh, um, uh, Google uh, Earth, and you know stuff like that. So it was okay. I, I it, well, I never did really finish it. it. You can, I don't know if you can see that. There's a lot of red in there where I didn't have 
the uh, uh, correct information. So I, you know, I just put something in there so I could continue it on. I never went back to it. It was it was quite overwhelming, as you can imagine. Okay. <laughs> so then I went to uh, another family and I started. Oh, by the way, most of the information came as a download off of off of one of the. Uh, at that time, it was off of. Roots Magic, but I could do the same thing from Family Tree Maker. Um, in the narrative, they have one of the options of published reports is a narrative, either a life story or whatever. So then I switched to just doing one person at a time. And, and I started again with my grandfather, a different grandfather, and um, actually one that I was very close to. And I put together a little different booklet uh, and that seemed to work a little bit better, uh, be, you know, I, and I included information in, in generalities about his ancestors, okay? I didn't, um, the intent was never to, in this case, document everything, okay? It was just to do a final, in essence, narrative of him with the idea that when I went to the next level, I would do a narrative of him, okay? And then the next level. And eventually I could put them all together and end up with something like this, okay? Well, I didn't, I didn't get there. <laughs> I haven't there yet. <laughs> yeah. I'm still at the first level. <laughs> but I, I, it, it's come back to me again when I'm thinking about it. I need to do that. <laughs> It's a good project. I was, I, I was real happy with this, actually, about the individual. I thought there was a very interesting, you know, life story of him and uh, with highlights of what he did and, and uh, you know, where, where he went to school, where he lived, uh, what he did for a living. And I talked about, uh, briefly mentioned, you know, his, well, he was married and his family. And then I included just the mention of, of the, his children, and then uh, so on. So, you know, so, kind of Tom, good start. Tom so. when you mentioned then you had the grandfather or uh -huh. whatever he was, and then uh -huh. you, you, you talked about him, you mentioned only his spouse and children. Right. Then you said the next level. What was the next level down? One his, of his no, children uh, or simply uh, your uh, direct uh, ascendant? No, it would be his father oh his, his father oh you went the other family. way okay yeah, and and i i quit i didn't go any further because he was a a, a family of 13 so okay. i wasn't quite good <laughs> yeah because i i you do know, have I, a tendency I learned, I learned early on with all these big families that i couldn't possibly do everybody yeah so i've i have tried to stick i made a conscious effort to stick with my actual by blood relatives yeah i know, know. i'm because kind of I at can't... that point now i i i but it was in a search to to try to find out more about my man a two times great grandfather so i went with all of his children my son right. and and so on and then i got and i was researching lightly but at least trying to find names of yeah. each of their yeah. families yeah. and their children yeah. hoping yeah. to find some connection that would give me more information yeah because a lot of times but, yeah a yeah. lot of times when they got to a certain age they tended to go live with one of their children right so the only way you could find them was to do the to, to research yeah. the children you yeah know? And especially when you get like in wisconsin you get past the 1905 they try to go older than 1905 uh, census. Yeah. Because they didn't live. They only listed the head yeah. of the household. You know? And it, it's, it's difficult. Um, in my case, I'm researching primarily um, Port Royal, Virginia, which is along the Rappahannock River and uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And the, but my time periods are so early it was prior to them doing state censuses, right, which would yeah, be a yeah. great fill-in. And of course, it seems like everything happened that was important at around 1890. 
which oh, of course we you know yeah i, I can't believe this is the yeah. perfect time period everything. Not there. Yeah. everything important happened in 1890 seems like it yeah. one of the one of the things that i've figured out in trying to do these narratives is the grandchildren and i've got older grandchildren they're graduating from high school now already and that type of stuff they don't want paper yeah they want it on the computer right <clears throat> i scanned all of our family pictures from our norwegian side steve uh which was about 250 photos and i've mentioned this before and when i got done with them all and cleaned them up and spent some time doing it and it wasn't as big a job as it sounds but it, it took some time i put it up on dropbox for everybody to download no one wanted no one wanted the physical pictures right no one yeah. wanted to have a family tree right. printed out they said put yeah. it on a computer for me that's why i'm going to read it yeah it's yeah. something to think about as we do this <clears throat> yeah. it's not as it's not what we would have liked to have done 15 20 years ago but today kids are they don't want to pull that push that stuff around right I find it interesting so so when they did the narrative steve you just put a like an electronic Put a uh, file up someplace and say, yeah. download it if you want it. Yeah, I thought or, about doing a Facebook page, too. I've thought about that, and uh, I just haven't gone any farther with well, it. Well, you could put a you could put a, uh, a link on your Facebook page, because you don't want to put the whole document on no, there. No, but, no, uh, no, no. Because no. you're going to have multiple sure. documents if you do it the way you're talking about. But I'm just saying, is one thing I'm yeah. kind of seeing and reading about is get rid of the paper. No one oh, yeah. wants oh, it. Yeah. 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 Well, well and then coming. you have to worry about the privacy issues too. Yep. And the copyright. Yes. And that's why I just put it up on Dropbox um, or something like that and then say, yeah. okay, here's the people who can take it. That's it. No one else can get into it. Yep. Well, right. it's similar to, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, finish. Oh, I was just going to say those memories that Steve was talking about, about people arguing about the memories. And then I found even when I was, um, showing some of my family some Irish uh, genetic genealogy, just even general research. And then I was talking about, well, let's talk about, you know, who had red hair, who had curly hair, who had blue eyes. And, you know, we were arguing over the color of so-and-so's eyes. No, he did not have blue eyes. And, you know, so I know you get into all of that and, and it's just curious. That's why if you put it something in like a Facebook or even if it's on your Facebook page and you throw out something each week, you know, a picture with an, some kind of narrative or whatever, and then people can comment on it. And then that would kind of, uh, to your point, you'd get the different perspectives of- That's an interesting know, way of doing it, yeah. I, I don't remember him being funny or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the Dark County Historical Society is putting on Facebook excerpts from uh, I think the book on the old cemeteries, Laura, that uh, Kaylert did. Hmm. And they're doing sections, of, a small bite section of, of history of different buildings in Door County and the building book and all that. And oh, so that's, that's what Trudy puts on, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that's what, I mean, that's kind of like what Michelle is saying. Do a little yeah. bite of that book. Mm hmm. You kind of have to pay attention to copyright, though, when you're doing it on a public site. That's the trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're running up on an hour now, so I think we'll call an end to this meeting and um, meet again in a couple weeks on the sure. third Thursday of the month. And I hope you can join us again, Michelle. Yes. And ironically, I believe I will be in Wisconsin caring for my nephews on that date but the next one so don't think i already dropped out it's just that then i'm physically there so okay well it was nice having you join us this was great i, I really appreciate meeting everybody and really valuable insight I, I really enjoyed it thank you very much thank you thank you bye Take care, everyone bye everybody have a good week bye bye thank bye. you